Well, welcome again as we look at another one of the stumbling blocks that some of you have to looking at Christianity. Um, we've looked at scripture, science, suffering, and now we're going to look at sex and sexuality. Now, why would that be a stumbling block? I think in today's culture it is because our society is completely sex obsessed, but also because our society is very confused about what sex is and um, has the wrong impression about the church. So when I wrote the ass book, I was asked, is sex really bad? If yes, how come some of the younger people I know do it and nothing ever happens to them? Is sex before marriage a sin? What does God say about same-sex marriage? And so on. Well, the Bible gives us a very wholesome and healthy attitude towards sex. It's not the one that people often think religious people have, which is very negative. The Bible's view is actually a very positive one. So. I would suggest there are two main philosophies that we can have, or maybe three towards sex. One is to say that sex is just an appetite that we can indulge as we please. Um, doesn't matter who you do it with, doesn't matter whatever, you, you just do it because it gives you pleasure and whatever your taste is, what it, you know, and so on. And that, I think that's, that, that's the view of recreational sex within our society, and I think it is absolutely devastating in the harm it causes. Then there was, I, I don't want to say puritanical, because I don't think the Puritans were like this, but there's a very rigid view of sex which almost regards it as dirty. And in fact, even saying the word, um, you can use other words, I guess. And again, I don't think that is biblical. Whereas the biblical attitude is the one I'm, I'm going to mention here. Now, let me read, for example, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Well, let me just go through some of that. Sex, marriage, and identity, gender identity, are so important to us because they are part of what it means to be a human being. The question also gets asked in our culture because the biblical teaching is under attack in our culture. And to hold to the biblical teaching means that you're regarded as at best weird and at worst a hateful bigot. And also, there has been a great deal of hypocrisy in the church with some people saying one thing and then doing another. The Bible, however, is not confused in its teaching. Sex is not bad because it is something that God has given us. It is God who gave us our bodies, not the devil. He's made us male and female. Again, something increasingly important in our very confused culture. And he made us with the ability to love, to express that love physically, and to produce children through that act of love. Now, there are other kinds of love as well. but point about this is the Bible does not regard sex as bad or as dirty. Indeed, the very opposite. It is sacred and holy. So you can have the dirty view, you can have the sacred and holy, you can have the cheap view. However, where things go wrong is this. Though God is the giver of pleasure, the devil is the perverter of pleasure. Just because it feels good does not make it good. God has set the limits for sex. It should be within the context of marriage. Genesis tells us that sex unites a husband and wife in an intimate knowledge of one another. It's not a shameful thing. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Genesis 2, 24. But instead of uniting a man and a woman in, as one flesh, when sex is used wrongly, it is perverted and ends up bringing disunity, harm, hatred and destruction. Paul tells the Galatian church, Galatians 5.19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when I was asked that question, the person seemed to assume that if you did something wrong, you'd be punished immediately. That's not the case. The appearance that people commit sexual sin and nothing ever happens to them has nothing to say about whether it's right or wrong. 
if you went out and killed somebody and you seemed to get away with it, nothing happened to you, it wouldn't make it right. But I, I note that when we do not use our bodies in the way that God intended, lots of things do happen. Sexually transmitted diseases, broken relationships, destroyed families, perverted minds, pornography, rape, prostitution, and very much tormented individuals. It is best for us to follow the Maker's instructions. And it's also good to remember that one day we all have to answer to God for what we do with his gifts, including the gifts of our bodies. Now, same-sex marriage and so on, uh, I'm going to say to you it doesn't exist, not in a biblical sense, because marriage is between a man and a woman. Civil partnerships do exist. Are they right? I don't think so, no. Our society has chosen to go that route, and I think it's a very harmful one. Now, I'm going to add on to this a clip of something that I recorded a few years ago which attempted to answer the question about homosexuality. But I do want to say this. I, when we're talking about sexual sin, homosexuality is one aspect. Homosexual acts are one aspect of that. They're, I don't think they're by, they're by any means the biggest a aspect of that. But the point about same-sex marriage is two men don't become one flesh, two women don't become one flesh. And same-sex marriages cannot fulfill one of the great purposes of marriage, that is, the procreation of children. I think there are enormous consequences for our society if we reject this teaching. This doesn't mean that homosexuality is the worst sin, or that homosexual sinners are worse than heterosexual ones. Most of the sexual sins described in the Bible are nothing to do with homosexuality. But it does mean that all of us as Christians are to live sexually pure lives because we want to honor God with our bodies. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Flee from sexual immorality, says Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Well, there's much more that could be read and said on this, and I do invite you to write me privately, or if you want something discussed publicly, that's fine, we can do that as well. Um, you know, logically, I do find myself in this position of saying, I think if I wasn't a Christian, I'd probably go along with the recreational view of sex in our society. And I'd end up use, using, abusing, being abused. I think that there's a certain logic to that, but it's a perverse logic. It's a logic which regards human beings as nothing more than animals who exist for our own pleasures. And that is not true. But as I said, I'm not gonna go the route of saying, oh, we've gotta go, Yuck, that's dirty, that's wrong, because it's not. It's a gift from God. And there's so much that could be said. Some of you who are watching this will have experienced sex in a really bad way. You will have been abused. Sadly, far too much of that occurs even within the church. It is an absolute perversion of what God intends. Some of you will have used sex as a means just to of escape to get some pleasure for yourself and it just hasn't worked it's like drinking salt water some will have experienced dire consequences of that and all that I can say is just simply this Jesus Christ came to die for us I wonder why he appealed to the prostitutes because they knew they were sinners and they knew they needed salvation and he accepted them now some of you will try to justify your sexual sin by saying, well, this is more modern, the Bible's out of date, and so on. I'm saying you can't do that and be a Christian. You cannot claim to follow Christ whilst rejecting what Christ teaches. And in one sense, the outworking of it may be quite difficult, but the reality of what he teaches isn't. We know. Well, I pray that the Lord would forgive us for all our sins, not just sexual sins. I pray that we would know what it is to rejoice in him. I pray we would follow the positive teaching of the Bible. So uh, we'll leave it there. I will. Uh, here's the, um, what we used to do, flea bites. Here's the flea bite that I did on homosexuality. God bless you and please do feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions or comments.
Bye. Okay, I hear you. What do I think about homosexuality? I haven't been talking about homosexuality. I don't particularly like talking about it. I don't know all that much about it, but you're asking me, so I will tell you. I have a sneaking suspicion that you're asking me not because you have a general interest in views of sexuality, but because you've made your mind up and you've decided that I'm a bigot. So you're really asking me, why are you such a homophobic bigot? The issue of homosexuality or sexuality in general is the shibboleth issue of our culture, meaning it's the issue by which people discern whether we're nice and liberal and kind and good or whether we're nasty right-wing reactionaries. The question is the when did you stop beating your wife question. So I'm glad you asked because I want to answer that by asking that we go to a bigger context. See, I want to ask you, is there any form of sexuality that you would consider would be wrong. And you're an intelligent person, so you're going to say, well, yes, of course, bestiality or necrophilia or pedophilia, they're wrong. And then I'm going to ask you, how do you know that? How do you know that they're wrong? You know, 20 years ago, people would have thought, most people would have thought, homosexuality is kind of wrong. But now, if you think that it's wrong, you're wrong. You're clearly beyond the pale. Can you imagine what's going to happen in 20 years' time? What if the zeitgeist changes? In 20 years from now, if bestiality is considered fine, would, you, would, would that make it fine? Would you accept it? And are we really saying that it's only society that determines what right and wrong is? Is right and wrong really that flexible? The Christian view is that homophobia of any kind is wrong. Why should we be afraid of homosexuality or homosexuals? Now, I know the word homophobia is used in different ways, but we accept that it is wrong. I'm, I'm going to make a confession. I'm a Christian, so I believe in God. And uh, that's, that shouldn't be too much of a shock to you and too much of a surprise. And I want to say I'm an Ikea Christian. Other furniture stores are available. This is not an advert. What I mean is this, I pick up my flat pack chair and I take it home. I count out the screws. I look at everything that's supposed to be there. And if there's one missing, I go back to the store because I follow the maker's instructions exactly. What does God say? Well, he created us male and female. He created us as sexual beings and he created sex to be within the context of marriage. So sex outside marriage, whether heterosexual or homosexual, is wrong. And he created marriage to be between a man and a woman. This is for the good of society, for the upbringing of children, for mutual companionship, and so on. Now, you might immediately say, oh, wait a minute, I don't agree with that. That's wrong. That's I say, okay, fair enough. But I need you to tell me why it's wrong. I don't need you just to say that it is wrong. Because I have a certain advantage on my side. This is the view of society, which has, or of, or of marriage rather, within our society, which has been the bedrock of our culture for over 1,500, 2,000 years. What are you going to replace it with? Because I think you're free-flowing, do whatever you want, who cares about sexual? I don't think it works. And here's my other problem. You may disagree with me. I want to see your evidence. What you are not permitted to do and claim to be reasonable is say, ah, you're just a bigot for thinking that. Ironically, by condemning me for having a different view from you, that makes you the bigot not me. We follow the maker's instructions. You just want to make it up and follow your own. I'm sorry. You're going to build a very shaky house on very shaky foundations and it will completely collapse. He's given us the instructions that are best for us and for our society collectively as human beings. So for the good of society, for the good of humanity, let's just stick with what God has given us.